Also, at this time, uh, I want to introduce a special friend. He's one that I've corresponded with for about 10 years now and uh, begged him to come. And I was so gratified today when he uh, talked to a reporter and he said I should have come years ago. Let me introduce you to the playwright for a very important work here, the miracle worker that we've been performing for 35 years, Mr. William Gibson. Mr. Gibson? Yes. <clears throat> If he wants to make just a remark or two, and if you have a question or two, he said he'd be happy to address that. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> what am I supposed to do here? <laughs> I'll answer questions. That's what uh, Miss America did. I just want to say thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I have a question. Thank you. I'm glad I came down finally. I wasn't going to come, and uh, Mike McMacken wrote me such an eloquent letter, I called him up and I said, you changed my mind, and here I am. Yes. It, for me, it's an extraordinary experience to, to be present in the house and on the grounds, uh, and there were things, uh, I'm, I'm talking with people today, there were things I learned which I wish I had known when I wrote the play. They might have ended up in the play. but. Uh, it's, uh, for me, the, the most, you know, one of the most striking things, which is what Heather was just talking about, by the way, education, getting a degree. When Annie was a child, she lost her parents. Some relatives put her in a poor house, a Tewksbury Arms house, it was called, which was the garbage dump of Massachusetts. Every, all the, all the unwanted personnel of the state were dumped into this place and she lived there for several years and she was blind legally blind she was un unable to uh, read uh, totally illiterate and she had a she had a brother whom she was taking care of in this place and he died and she it seemed like a totally hopeless situation now there was a board of trustees that came and made annual visits around the grounds of Tewksbury. They're headed by a man named Sanborn, who was a friend of Emerson. And Annie knew, and she was now 13 years old, and she knew that Sanborn was coming on this trip, and she followed him around. She could make out black and white, masses of black and white. She followed them around, this man in his wing collar and swallowtail and top hat and so on, and didn't dare to speak to him until they approached the gate, and he was about to leave. And at that point, she burst through to him and said, Mr. Sanborn, Mr. Sanborn, I want to go to school. And that sentence changed not only Annie's life, it changed Helen's life, and it, and, and it changed the lives of millions of people around the world through Helen's subsequent work. So, by all means, go to school. <laughs> Anything else, anyone? Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't hear. It's not all that different, but uh, you know, it's it's not a. Uh, I I saw I saw a house that eventually turned into a stage set, so I didn't see a real house there. And uh, when you're writing a play, you think, oh, here's the set here, and here's the stairs here, and so on. And you make up the stuff, you lay it out pretty much as you need to. And I thought from the from the Annie's letters that when they took Helen to the garden house, when Annie wanted complete charge of her, that that house was a couple of blocks away in the woods. And I'm amazed that it's right next door like a garage. And that Helen was taken out on a carriage ride round and round and finally put practically into her own room and there, uh, you know, went un underwent a sort of a Spartan regime with her teacher, Annie. And uh, I was told that in that garden house, Helen was born. And I said to Sue, and here in this garden house, she was reborn. And I think that's a striking thing. So the, there are a lot of facts about this house, which I simply didn't know. And uh, the... Uh, well, of course, we're talking about also 1887, which is over 100 years ago, and, uh, you know, Tuscumbia was a little different then.
I learned about it when I was about 10 years old and was in seventh grade and the city of New York gave us two textbooks and one of them was a little green book called The Story of My Life by Helen Keller. The other was called Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare. And I remember those two books. And uh, so I knew about that story from then on. And uh, I came back to it a couple of times out of professional interest in thinking it might make a play. And finally, I did make a play out of it. Mr. Gibson, do you, do you get many letters from blind or deaf blind people? Have they written you over the years about the miracle worker? Yes, and, and I'm, I must say it's very gratifying to me. I, I, don't, I don't take the credit for this miracle work. I always tell people I didn't write this story. Those two ladies wrote it. And I acted as a dramatic secretary. I put it, I laid it out and put it down. A woman came up to me at a meeting about two years ago and said, I want to tell you that we, had a, we have a deaf, blind, mute son. And years ago, when we first saw this play, uh, we were feeling totally hopeless. And we came away be, from the play feeling nothing is impossible and she said that boy is now getting his graduate degree and such and such and his whole life was changed around she said and i think the, the play has taught many many people that kind of thing and it's it's not it's not just a play anymore because it affects so many people's lives and uh that gratifies me more than anything but i but there is that kind of response and always has been yes yes when you, when you first came on the ground today well, I stopped and looked at it, and my heart turned over a little bit, and I went in and I saw some photographs in the museum room here, pictures of Annie and Helen that I'd never seen before, and I just filled up, because the story is still full of meaning. For, for, it's, it's, it's a story that will never die. It's, you know, it's one of the really great American stories, and it's never going to be forgotten. It's going to be remembered like the discovery of America by Columbus, if he did it. What is the most unusual? I don't know. I don't. I can't think of that. It it, it gets done. It's it's never left the boards, and it's always being done. Uh, it's, it's done a great deal, of course, in schools. And uh, since this play is my love letter to the act of teaching, I think that's a very appropriate place for it to be done. And, and so I would say those are the performances that in a way mean the most to me. Uh, however, I'm not averse to you know professionals doing it in a professional theater either. <laughs> Right. Was there one that was more difficult than another? No. It was, the play was originally written for TV, and, and it was for camera, and, and ca writing for the camera is child's play. Uh, you, you, you change the subject whenever you get bored and you move to the camera to Asia or to the North Pole, whatever you want. There's that great freedom of the camera, and it doesn't require any sustained structural work in organizing a scene and so on. Uh, when I turned it into a stage play, I spent about six months, since I spent about six weeks the first time for Cameron, I spent about six months for the stage, so it was harder to do that, but I had, I had to fill out everything. I had to fill out the family life and stuff, because the people, you put them on stage, you can't turn the camera off. They're on stage, and you've got to do something with them. And that required a different level of writing. But uh, it, was not, it was not hard to write, and uh, it, was a, you know, it was an act of a pleasure to write all the way through. Somebody How long were you involved in the research and writing of the Miracle Worker, and uh, how many rewrites were there? I, uh, I wanted to, I, I was running a drama group in a psychiatric institution. I thought I'd put it together an evening of one act, and one of the things I had in mind, we had a, a, a dance teacher there, and I thought I could write this, uh, a, a monologue about Helen's situation and the dancer could do something in dance terms and that would be it. And I wrote, therefore, out of Annie's letters, uh, a synopsis of the action, and I had this. And uh, that, that didn't happen, by the way, that dance thing didn't happen. 
But then sometime later, uh, I said to my friend Arthur Penn, who was a TV director, I have an idea for a TV play, if you're interested. He said, oh, send it to me. So I sent him down a few pages, and he called me up and said, I've sold it. When can you write it? And uh, when can, in fact, he said, when can you put a week into writing it? Uh, you know, they were working. This was the days of live TV. They were working very fast. And uh, so I said, well, as much as my wife is pregnant and expecting a child any minute, I don't think it'll happen this week. So I then spent... Uh, three half weeks before the child was born and three half weeks after he was born. So in six weeks I did the TV version. And, and then I, I didn't require, I knew the materials and the prime materials were Annie's, you know, from this house, she wrote a letter every three or four days for the first year or two of, of her residence down here until she took Helen back to Perkins. And uh, those letters are extraordinary letters. For a, for a girl who was illiterate at the age of 13. And, uh, you know, she was 20 when she came here. So the, 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 the real, that's the real documentation of the play is, is the detailed description Annie gives of every move she and Helen made together. Uh, uh, anything beyond that is uh, peripheral. Hmm? So that was all that I just said. But I knew those letters pretty well because I fell in love with them. Yes. One more question, and we're going to need to leave. Who has it? Obviously, you've met Helen before. I have. What was the conversation if you did? I have met Helen before. Did you meet her? I, meet, I met her once, but it was after I wrote the play. Her advisor said, let's see how the play goes on television. If it's successful, you can have lunch with us. So it was successful, and Helen bought us lunch at the Harvard Club. What was the gist of the conversation? What was the gist of the conversation? Well, Polly Thompson was there. Nella Henney, who was, the, who was the biographer of Annie Sullivan, was there. Uh, my wife was there. Helen was there, of course, and I was there. And uh, Helen, and the conversation was sort of general. And when Helen, uh, Helen listened to it by holding out a hand, and Polly or Nella would spell into her hand, and when she got bored, she'd just pull her hand in and think her thoughts and uh, come back and see, are they talking about anything more interesting now? And she didn't talk very much. It was really like having lunch with Polly Thompson. And, uh, but Helen was very, uh, our, she, she spoke in a, in a very strained way, uh, but, but somehow she got talking about a mistress of D'Annunzio's, the Italian poet. And she said, he called her his golden princess. And that was the kind of conversation. It was a very high-class conversation, actually. And Helen looked like the Queen of England. She looked very beautiful, but, uh, you know, she was all fixed up, and uh, she just looked, she was a very striking presence. And when she walked into the room, everybody knew it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you.